Hello everyone, my name is Nick Anella. I'm a second year here and I am the treasurer for White Hat. Uh, today I want to talk to you a little bit about the introduction to Unix. And the, the reason that there's a question mark there, since a lot of people have asked me, in Unix question mark matches any one character, so I'll let you all guess which character the question mark is supposed to match. You. <laughs> so, the agenda for today. Uh, we're going to start with talking a little bit about the history of Unix, uh, where it came from, where it is today. Then we're going to talk about how it structures, what makes Unix Unix, in addition to some of the benefits of it. Then one thing I really want to get into is what's called the Unix philosophy, sort of the guiding developmental principle behind the creation of Unix. And we're going to end with the practical application that Nathan talked about uh, over the wire. So good start with is, what is Unix? So actually, technically, there is no Unix anymore. Uh, the operating system Unix itself was discontinued in the late 90s, early 2000s. But it was originally an operating system created between the 60s and the 80s in what's called Bell Labs. That is Bell Labs after Alexander Graham Bell himself. It's now known today as AT&T, if any of you have heard of that company. So this operating system took the technical world by storm. It was one of the f first majorly, distri majorly like, distributed to other, distributed to multiple groups operating systems. And it has f formed how almost every OS is designed today except for Windows. All, almost every OS today has some callback to Unix, again, except for Windows. So where did Unix come from? Well, to do that, we have to go back. Specifically to the 60s. So back in the 60s, when people weren't protesting civil rights, smoking weed, they were programming operating systems, because that's what we did back then. We. Uh, specifically, I want to talk a little bit about something called the Multics project. Now, Multics was this operating system project that was distributed across the country. MIT was writing part of it, Berkeley Labs was writing part of it, and Bell Labs was writing part of it. This was an operating system that was designed to run the huge, uh, the huge servers and the huge mainframe stuff that would take up a whole room, needed 10 people to maintain, and had an entire AC unit just to keep it cool. Now, Multics introduced some pretty cool new stuff, things like daemons, which were programs that ran in the background and took care of some of the tasks that you wouldn't want a user to normally have to deal with, like logging in or making sure pixels are displayed to a screen. Another thing it introduced was something called dynamic linking. If any of you have used C or Java before, that's the hashtag include or the import statement at the top of your program. Before Multics, you couldn't do that. You just had to write everything in one file. It was awful. But the problem was, this was a really bloated operating system. The system was designed by so many different groups that there were a lot of redundancies in it. Uh, there were four different ways to write a file to the terminal. And there was, a lot, there was something called no process segmentation, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but basically meant that one person could completely trash another person's program. There was no uh, keeping people separate. And so Bell Labs saw this and began to pull out. They were like, this is not the project we want to be dealing with. This is not a way, good use of our time. And they began to take engineers off the project. Now, one of the last engineers they removed is Ken Thompson. Now, Ken Thompson is like the Unix guy. He, a lot of sources attribute him to being one of the, if not the, founder of Unix. And like all great Unix people, he has a fantastic beard. You think I'm kidding about the fantastic beard. During the 80s, there was literally a term, long hairs and short hairs, for the terms of if you, had a long, if you had a long beard, you were a developer. If you had a short beard, you were a business guy. And this, this terminology was actually used. So I'm not just making it up about the beard. They all have fantastic beards. I Look it up. So Ken Thompson began this as a side project at AT&T. This was not their main project. He was just like, OK, Multics failed. So what, what went wrong about it? And what he determined was, the fact that it was so distributed, that so many different parts were made without any communication. So he said, all right, well, let's try to build this inside of AT&T. And he began building his own operating system. And eventually, his whole team, including some greats known as uh, Ben Kernigan and Dennis Ritchie, started working on this project with him. 
the first release was actually in 1969, and the name Unix was a pun on the name Multix because Multix was made by multiple people, so Unix was made by one person. And it only ran on the PDP-11. This is the PDP-11. <laughs> ah! <laughs> It's, that's a very old computer. So one big problem with Unix when it originally came out is for the first three years, they hadn't invented C yet. C was invented in 1971, uh, and it wasn't ported until 1972. So for the first three years, all of this operating system was written in Assembler. If any of you, the reason I asked why 225, Assembler is a very, very low level language. You specify every instruction that the CPU runs. It's really difficult to write, and so, like, that's pretty badass that these people had the time and dedication to write a whole operating system in this. But in 1971, C was invented. And then 1972, Dennis Ritchie, one of the inventors of C, decided to help rewrite Unix in this language. And that was a huge turning point for this. Because at that point, C could run on almost any operating system, any computer. As long as the computer supported a C compiler, you could, you could run Unix on it. It was an incredible, it allowed the operating system to spread really prolifically. This is the PDP-11. Ah. So until the through the 1970s, Unix was distributed with its source code. Now, if any of you have heard the term open source, almost all programs back then were open source. Because computing was so new, there was no idea that, oh, I need to keep this code, this code secret. So people would just distribute it so people could build on it. It was a great practice that has unfortunately fallen out of practice. <coughs> Oracle. <coughs> <laughs> so this code was picked up by a group of Berkeley students. Now, these Berkeley students wanted, saw the operating system, saw what they could do with it, and thought, well, what if we take this one step further? We develop it even more integrated. We try to make every part of the operating system intertwined with each other, and thus created BSD, the Berkeley Software Distribution. And actually, it grew up alongside Unix. It actually became also quite popular. Uh, BSD claimed that it was more de oriented towards developers, more de oriented towards the long hairs, as I said earlier. And it did something called unified user land and kernel production, which I'll talk about later. But basically, it means instead of these two main parts of where Unix had two main parts developed separately, it was actually all developed as one, so it could interface even more tightly. Now, unfortunately, in the 1980s, a gigantic legal battle slash flame war occurred where all the people who liked Unix were really championing Unix, and all the people who really liked BSD really liked BSD. And basically, AT&T came out and said, hmm, well, they're using part of our code. Let's sue them. <laughs> so AT&T sued BSD, and uh, BSD actually like suffered a lot and had to pay a lot of consequences. But one thing. I really find cool about BSD is their response to this was not, oh, well, we're sued. Like, we lost all this money. Let's stop. They're like, all right, screw it. They ripped out all of the Unix code and rewrote their own. So, and that's, that's where BSD really started to fork away from Unix, when BSD basically ripped out most of at and code, put in their own, and started to develop their own kind of path. So this was the 80s for Unix, but really both of them still strayed pretty under, underground, especially with the dawn of Windows, until Linux. So in 1987, there was something invented called Minix. Minix was another thing, sort of like BSD, that was this, we want to create something, but we don't want to get sued by AT&T. So it was an implementation of Unix. It was released so that you could teach people about how operating systems work. It's actually still used at this school today. If you take operating systems with Dr. Nico, you will do a lot of work with Minix. However, the guy who invented Minix had one student named Linus Torvalds who looked at Minix and said, this is written horribly. I hate all of this. Like, th those are literal, obviously not, he didn't speak English. This was in Glasgow, but, or, yeah, I think Glasgow. But he, like, he didn't like it. So he scrapped the whole thing and, as a student, wrote his own, uh, wrote Linux. Uh, Linux. In 1991, he published the first Linux kernel operating system. And to date, this is the most popular open source version of Unix. It's still readily maintained. There's still a huge community about, around it. Most people who have heard who don't use Windows or Mac use Linux. It's the, the third operating system. 
And that kind of leads into where Unix is today. As I mentioned, Unix stopped being maintained by AT&T. Other legal problems happened. Uh, Bell Labs and AT&T split apart. And after a while, it couldn't be maintained. But instead, these major branches are maintained. We have Linux with multiple S's that have been built on it. If any of you have heard Ubuntu, Debian, Arch, Mint. These are all what are called distros of Linux. They're distributions. The BSDs recovered from those legal battles, ripped out code, and later branched off into FreeBSD, OpenBSD, NetBSD, all different operating systems that focus on different security. And the one that actually I find surprises the most people, OS X. The Mac operating system is based off BSD. It's another Unix implementation. Uh, that's why I say every operating system except Windows is based off this. OS X, one of the most popular, has been running the Apple lineup for years, and it's based off of FreeBSD. So that's kind of where we are in regards to what Unix is, where it came from, and where it is now. All these different separate distributions. But how do we still encapsulate them? How do we still encapsulate them under one umbrella of Unix? Well, one big reason is the structure. So here is a little graph of how Unix works. Uh, ab un Above my, my turtley friends right here, we have the hardware. And the hardware is the basis of any computer. You, need to, you actually need to be able to type on something, be able to see a screen, have a CPU to run things. Now, reading that hardware are things called drivers. Now, drivers are just programs that operate specifically with the hardware. They turn the electrical signals of typing or the click of a mouse into ones and zeros that the computer can read. They're specialized programs that allow a computer to understand, well, just because I press a button, why does that mean W? So above the drivers is what's called the kernel. Now, this is the first major part of the Unix operating system. The kernel is a low-level C, usually written in C interface, that basically talks between the drivers and every other program. And why they do that, I'm going to talk about on the next slide. But the kernel basically sits as an interface between the hardware and the drivers and what's called user land. It's an interesting name. but So in user land is just everything that isn't the kernel. It's all the other programs. So Chrome, Firefox, uh, PowerPoint, uh, off Microsoft Office. It also includes things called uh, the shell and the desktop manager. The desktop manager is basically what you see that's not text. So everything that isn't, everything that isn't uh, the shell, this text interface, is run by the desktop manager. So if you look, uh, this is one desktop manager known as KDE. And that's like, so your desktop, that's how you have graphical interfaces, have desktops, run apps, basically anything that doesn't look like this. This is called the shell. The shell is how everyone originally interfaced with Linux or Unix. Um, by the way, if anyone has any questions, I'm, I really enjoy this stuff, so I'm, I might talk kind of fast. Nathan. What do the turtles mean? The tur that is a great question. So <laughs> if you notice, I put some turtles under my hardware. Why did I do that? That's kind of weird. Yes. So there's a phrase in computer science known as turtles all the way down. It comes from this old adage that instead of the world being held in place by gravity and all, it's actually just on a bunch of turtles. And each turtle is progressively larger and larger. And someone asked, well, what's under the largest turtle? Another bigger turtle. So it's kind of become an adage in computer science that uh, at, under the hardware where I don't understand. So it's turtles. I don't know what it is, so it's probably, it might as well be turtles down there. I. <laughs> But that's what the turtles are for. It's anything more abstract than hardware. All right, any other questions? Cool. So as I was saying, the shell is a text interface with the computer. So for example, this is my, this is my shell. Nope. Where is it? It's there. That's it. That's it? Is, it, is there typing? Oh, there we go. Thank you. Go to the home. Uh, bring the money up. Go All right. Uh, go to the homebrew. It's okay. The no, cool. It's it's fine. Uh, 
Yeah, so, it's fine. So this is the terminal. So if we look back at the, if we look back at this diagram, basically he, this we get to the process. We have the hardware, then we have our drivers and kernel, which talks to the hardware. Then we have our shell, which talks to the kernel and sends information up into user land. You have the desktop manager, which allows you to launch Windows and applications. And then you have the actual applications themselves. And this sort of defines the Unix stack, how something goes from being hardware to getting to watch Netflix for whatever reason you would want to watch Netflix. That might be <laughs> chilly. Um, <laughs> so, so why do they do it like Wait, this? I thought it was Linux and shell. So why do they do it like this? Why do they have this really complicated stack? Well, the reason is secure processing. Now, if any of you came to my talk at the beginning of the year, you'll remember one of the first things that I said are that users are evil. Users are evil. They will, they will break your operating system. They will put anything they can into your operating system to try to make things not work. And so one way to stop them from damaging your, your operating system, and more importantly, your hardware, is to make sure they can't touch it. So in user land, you can't touch the hardware, actually. You, there's, there's no way to physically interact with the hardware. Yeah. What instead you have to do is to tell the kernel to interact with the hardware. So what this takes form of the, is something called system calls. The way, for example, if I write a program that wants to see something, that wants to see if something has been inputted, if I want to read a line, what I have to tell my program to do is, all right, tell the kernel, hey, I want to read from the keyboard then the kernel reads from the keyboard and takes that results and sends it back to user land. Now, the idea with that is there are only specific things that I can tell the kernel to do. I can tell the kernel to read a file. I can tell the kernel to write to the screen. I cannot tell the kernel to send all my data to uh, anonymous. I mean, you can, but you, you shouldn't. Uh, and there are a lot of ways to put into Unix to prevent that. And this is one of those big ways, this idea of Making sure that the user's programs don't actually touch the hardware keeps you from overloading circuits and possibly breaking something that even you can't fix. So, we have our desktop manager and we have the shell. Now, a quick thing, I love the shell. We at White Hat love the shell. A lot of hacking and pen testing involves using the shell. It's a lower level, because it's a lower level, it's much faster, and it doesn't involve a GUI, so you can much easier try something, uh, much easier try something, get results back. Uh, it's much easier to work in, in a lower level setting. In addition, the shell is very well documented with things called the Linux manual pages. Now, if you ever do anything that involves writing C or anything lower level, you're going to become best friends with the Linux manual pages. These things hmm. explain how Linux, how the Linux operating system works, how to run commands in the terminal, and because C is such a huge part of Linux, it also has a huge manual of how to do things in C. It's really helpful, and it has gotten me through, if any of you have heard 357, it has gotten me through a lot of 357 stuff because I can just go to the terminal and be like, what does this function do? Oh, it copies things. Awesome. So these manual pages are really useful, and I'm going to show you in the practical part how to read these manual pages. Uh, finally, the way the shell works is by reading from the keyboard and printing a screen. However, that's not always how it has to work. This is the live demo portion, so this might, disclaimer, this might work, this might not, um, I'm hoping it does. So, let's say, there's a command in the terminal, there's a command in the terminal called echo. And what that does is just, whatever I print into it, goes back to the terminal. Let's say, <laughs> okay, so simple enough program. Now, what you can do, what you can do, in addition to echoing it to the terminal, what if you want to write it to a file instead? Well, in Multics, you would need like six or seven commands to do this. That's part of the reason why they jumped out of Multics, was because it was so complicated. Instead, what you can do is echo.
So what I'm saying here is echo that term, and then instead of writing it to the screen, write it into that file. It's the arrow kind of means point the output in there instead of to the screen. So now I can do this, and there's no output to the screen. So now another command, another command, cat, just means print a file to the screen. So if I cat Batman, look, Batman's in there. So it's this, it's this very useful utility where it's very easy to take something that would normally be put into the terminal and instead write it out, uh, write it out. Now, it can be done the other way, too. Look at cat again. If you do cat, then you can say hello, and it prints hello, and say pi, and it prints pi. By the way, if you ever want to exit a program, just control C. And that's on Mac and Linux, too. Control C will kill a program. So I can do cat, and I can write, take things in from the computer and write them out to the terminal. But what if I want to read something in from a file and write it to the terminal? Then you, just as easy it would seem, you can type cat, type it into cat, and now Batman's on the screen. So this kind of piping in and out of programs, this kind of taking in files or standard and or term, you can either take in files on the keyboard, and this kind of printing either out to files or to the screen is really essential to what I call the Unix philosophy. Now, the Unix philosophy came up when these people were first writing Linux, and it arose from writing these shell programs. And the idea is small, composable commands. The Ken Thompson and his associates firmly believe that it is much better to write a bunch of small commands that do one thing really well than write a big command that does all those things kind of well. Because what that means is, with that direct redirection, you can have one program do something. You can take some input, put it into one program, then, put it, then take it out, and put it into another program and take it out. Each tool slightly transforming the data until you ultimately get what you want to do with the data. That is why all the commands on the shell use text, because you can always be sure that you're going to put in text. You can always be sure that you're going to take out text. And it's this, and it's this kind of cycle of being able to slowly transform one type of data into another. So one example of this, um, I wrote a program a little while ago that just does this. So what this does is, I'm going to move over here now. So what this does is PS dash, PSAUX says, get all of my processes. Then grep says, all right, search my processes for this phrase. Then this command basically says, all right, search my processes for all these for this phrase, but don't look for looking for this phrase. It's a little bug in grep that basically means if you grep for something, it will find itself. Uh, so this removes it, and then this cuts out a specific part of this. So we can so we can go from something like this gigantic list of seemingly meaningless numbers to um, running this program, and all this is doing is running that little string, 10, 1002. And thus we can see the time at which my login happened. Because here, because here, we have look for all processes, look for the process that logged in, and then cut out the time that it started. So this idea of composing together different commands into making a program that's actually useful is incredibly important to Linux and all Unix in general. The best, oh, yeah? To make sure you don't lose people, do you want to explain that far? Oh, yes. Thank you very much. So, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. There's a bar between each of these commands. Now, what that basically means is, you know how I showed you how you can pipe things out and pipe things, put things out and put things into a program? This basically means take out the output of this and put it into the input of this. Then take the output of this and put it into this. Then take the output of this and put it into this. And because there's no bar here, print it to the screen. Does that make sense? Good luck. So what's the difference between that and the arrow? So the arrows allow you to put it anywhere you want. You can put it into a file, you can put it in a terminal, you can put it anywhere you want. This specifically means put it into whatever the next command is. 
Any other questions? Thank you, my man. Uh, cool. So, the best way I had this described was by the vice president of this club last year as a conversation with the terminal. You are in your in the native language of English able to tell the terminal to do something. It's able to tell you something back. You can tell it to do another thing, and tell you can tell it back. Versus with something like a GUI, you just tell it something, and that's the end. It processes the data, and you can't move forward with it. Or if you want to, you have to put it into another GUI. Or you have to man you have to manually do these things instead of letting the computer communicate with other parts of it. So, I've been talking a lot about Unix, and we kind of spun up our propeller hats a little bit on this. But we're about to move on to the practical part, because there's one thing I really wanted to bring up, and that's the idea of freedom versus convenience. Now, like I said, there are a ton of different Unixes. Every, there's all the Linux distributions, all the BSDs, Mac OS, and each one, what, usually what difference is, is the idea of how convenient are they to use versus how much customization you have. So on one end, you have things like OSX, Ubuntu, and Mint. These are simple distributions, very good for Unix beginners that hide a lot of the features. In a lot of these operating systems, you'll never even have to touch a shell. You'll just always be in the desktop manager, launching apps, sort of like you would in Windows. On the other end, there are things like FreeBSD, Arch, uh, Linux from scratch. These are highly customizable, very powerful distributions, but in a lot of, like for example, in Linux for Scratch, uh, Linux from Scratch, you start by getting a kernel, and then you build it from there. It can be a process. Just as a little side note, uh, kind of a running joke in White Hat, I have been through nine operating systems in the past week. I'm trying to find <laughs> one that I really like. Um, so I'm really experienced with all of these. Uh, so, but my point being, when if you choose to use Unix, and I highly recommend that you do, if for no other reason than this is a Unix campus, we use Unix on all of our servers and all of our services, make sure you pick one that fits your style. If you want to go for something like the Ubuntu or the Mint, uh, something that is a little easier to get into, and then move on to something like Arch or Linux from scratch. And just a little shameless plug, we actually have a couple members of the Unix, uh, the Cal Poly Linux users group who are here and will be hosting an event on Friday where they will install one of the one of Ubuntu or Linux or any of these distros on your machine and help you start to use it. So if you really want to, uh, if, okay, if you really want to, you can uh, go meet up with them. All right. Yes, Nathan. Also, as an important side note, it's like just because your friends using Arch does not mean you have to install Arch if you've never touched a Linux distro before. So just find what works for you and make it work. Like it doesn't have to be Arch, it doesn't have to be Linux from scratch. It can be Ubuntu, Linux Mint. Like Linux Mint is a great starting option. I run Linux Mint. That's the operating system I'm currently on. So like there's pick whatever you find easiest and whatever you like the most. All right. So You've heard a lot from me. Uh, we're going to go to the LBH, uh, which is going by hacking, if anyone had a question. But first, do, does any of you have any questions? I've said a lot of stuff to your faces. Uh, do you, any of you want to say some stuff back at my face? Yeah. Uh, so how much of, like, say, Ubuntu or whatever, do you miss out on if you're only running a virtual machine as opposed to, like, actually? Like, can you get everything from just a virtual machine? Yes, if you would, ju that's another way to try out Linux. You can install it on a virtual machine, which is, for any of you who don't know, a virtual machine is a uh, simulated computer inside of your computer. It allows you to install an operating system on it, work with it, uh, without affecting the actual computer. So, yeah, there's, if you want to start out with Linux, that's another great way, just installing it on a virtual machine. Or should I not? Do I want to talk about live booting? Yeah. Okay, so one, uh, another nice thing about Linux is if you just want to try it out, you can also uh, boot it from a USB drive. Uh, that's a little more complicated. I would defer to the guys from Cplug if you want to try that, go talk to them. I'm sure they'd be more than willing to help you set up with something with live booting. Just ask them about it. So, on that note, um, I'm running Kali Linux off a USB and I was wondering if you save files, does this save it directly to the hard drive or on the flash drive itself? So, alright. So, basically, uh, might I give a little just context? 
So Kali Linux is a, another one of the distributions of Linux. It's one that's specifically oriented towards uh, penetration testing. What that basically means is it's preloaded with a bunch of tools, hack systems. So things like uh, running uh, DDoS attacks, something called Metasploit. Uh, a lot of these tools are preloaded on Kali. And so a lot of security professionals like to have either it on a stick or on their computer. So when you work, how it actually saves depends on your configuration. With Kali Linux, you can configure it to save to USB drive or write to the disk. Uh, it really depends on how you set up the system. Uh, if you want to talk about specifics, I'd be more than happy to afterwards. But that's the general answer. Anyone else? Awesome. Oh, never mind. We'll see. Okay, so, um, everyone who has a, I'm sorry if you have a Windows machine, um, there are ways to do it, but... Shut up. Alright, we're good. Well, obviously I'm getting comments from the peanut gallery. So if everyone could go to this website, overthewire.org slash wargame slash bandit. So, basically what we're going to do is I'm going to walk you guys through the first couple of challenges. We're going to have a full yeah, event for this on Saturday, where uh, myself and a couple other officers will be in the lab from 12 to 3, just sitting around, uh, trying to help, willing to help you all out with, uh, willing to help you all out. Is everything okay? Yep. All right, cool. So, um, I always got to keep my eyes shut. <laughs> Unless you crash it. Unless you crash it. So, uh, this... So, this is the URL. Uh, if you click on bandit zero, this is the first level. So, the nice thing about over the wire is it's all in the shell. Yay. So, uh, by the way, clear is just like you want to clear your screen. Great command if you're giving a presentation, a lot of crap has been pushed onto your screen. So, the idea with bandit is it, this, the company that runs this over the wire is hosting a server. And on that server are all these different challenges. And the idea of each challenge is to go, in, get into that, go into the server, look around in it, and try to find the password to the next level. So in order to get into that server, the first thing you're going to need to know is SSH. Now, if there were not a very helpful uh, person standing up here walking you through this, the first thing you'd want to do is use the man command. The man command is the manual pages. So remember how I told you about those really, really helpful manual pages? Uh, they're awesome. So if you were to do man SSH, here is everything you'd ever need to know about SSH. Uh, it's really zoomed, so it looks a little scary. But that is, so if you're ever confused about a command or if you don't know what to do, go look at the manual page for it. And I guarantee you will find uh, more information. And if you don't, Google is your best friend. Uh, the Googles are good. So. What we're going to do is we're going to connect to Bandit server. So the way we're going to do that is SSH and then the location of the server, which is bandit0.labs. So this, by the way, this address can be found um, so this address or sorry, it's not bandit0, it's just bandit. So bandit, so this address can be found here. This is the address of the server. So this is where you're going to SSH into. So you do SSH, the address of the server, then dash L. Now, what this is, is this is called a flag. What flags do are like, all right, if I want to put the, are we still videoing this? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> if I want to put, in addition to just the main uh, option, if I want to put additional things, I have flags to designate things. So for example, the dash L flag means login. So we want to log into bandit zero. So this is the command you're going to want to type into your terminal. And you hit enter, and it's going to vomit a lot of stuff at us. So it's looking for a password. Now because this is the first level, we can look at the page, and look, the password is bandit zero. We're so good at this. So. Can I type? Yes. So it spit a lot of information at us, but at the bottom, gave us a prompt. So if you recognize this dollar sign from my terminal, yes, Max? Quick note, you might see a do you want to connect to the server? Uh, you have to type yes to get through that. Yeah. Yes, that's. Just a why. No. 
Yeah. Yeah. Type yeah. If you see that, type yes. Uh, it's just saying, oh yeah, if I see this server, I want to connect to it again. Uh, it's nothing dangerous. So now you have this prompt. So now we're in a now that we're in the server, how do we see anything on it? Well, the first command we're going to want to use is something called ls. Now, what ls does is list all the files inside of something. So if you look at, for example, so all of you are familiar with Finder. Like, let's say I look at my, my desktop folder. This folder, this folder is, at this, if we look at this view, it's actually just a listing of all the stuff that's inside my desktop folder. So what ls is is just a terminal version of that. We hit ls, and we see, oh, look, inside wherever we are, there's a file called readme. What do you want to do with that? All right. Does anyone remember the command that I use to read files? Just yell it out. Cat. Cat. Sweet. Dog. dog. Whoever said dog? <sighs> yes, scruffs. So let's cat the file. Hey, that looks like a password. Let's go for it. The, it's, it's super secure. So if I can find my mouse, I'm going to copy this. So. We have the password copied. However, we're still on the server. So, oh, Just out the OK. <laughs> uh, we have the password found, but we're still on the server. We need to get off the server so we can log into a different account. The way we do that is Control-D. What that says is close the connection. So it should log you out of Bandit. Now. So now we're logged out of Bandit, and we, now we want to log into Bandit 1. So if we look at this, we'll see that the way this works is you want to log into Bandit 1 with whatever the password is. So we're still going to connect to the same server. By the way, you're still totally OK. Like, if you have any questions about this, please ask me. Like, I love answering questions. It's my favorite thing. That's not sarcasm. I actually do. Uh, so. We're still going to connect to this same server, but now we want to log into Bandit 1. So see what we're doing here? Instead of logging into Bandit 0, we're now logging into Bandit 1. This is going to give us a different perspective on the server. So we log in. It's going to say stuff. And then I'm going to paste the password. And yeah, so when you paste into the terminal, it doesn't show up like with dots or anything. They want to make sure it's super secure so they just don't show anything. So you might paste into the terminal and it, like, it not show anything. That doesn't mean it didn't work. It just means the password is there and they don't want you to see it. So is everyone with me so far? Raise your hand if you're not. All right. Do you have any questions? Things not working? This site is not like. I don't maintain this site, so I have no idea if it will like break or like anything. Uh, but we're just going to hope. Cool. So do people want to go look around band at once, see if we can find the password? So um, since uh, I showed you it last time, what do you think is the first thing I should do here since I'm in this, uh, in this place? By the way, this is called the home directory. When you log into a server, the first place it's going to put you is the home directory. So what do you think I should do? Shout it out. Yeah, ls. Oh, I said it right? OK. Yeah. We want to ls list the files. See what's inside here. Great. There's a dash. <laughs> All right. So let's, so the next thing, now if ls doesn't give us enough information, we can actually put a flag on it to get a little more. We can do ls dash a. No, ls dash l. Yeah. So if we do ls-l, what that basically says is we want a little more information on this. So what this tells us, most importantly, is that this is a file. This is not just a random dash. So we need to cat that file. So let's try, shall we? <laughs> Nothing. Awesome. So why is that a problem? Yeah? So 
the reason that indicates that it's yeah, it doesn't have, yeah, that's right, right. It's different in BSD. Uh, yeah, so s this first thing, if it were a directory, here, let me log out real quick. So if I do ls in just, if I ls here, or ls-l, then see, these are all, they're all blue on my terminal because I have it set up, but these all have this little D in the front of it, which means they're a directory, which means they're a folder. So they have other things in it. Versus if you're on the server, oh, please tell me I still have the password. Boot. If you're, okay, uh, if you're on, so here you see that there isn't that D there. That means this is a file, not a directory. Yeah? Oh, um, OK. So if you saw right there, at one point, I pressed a button and suddenly commands flashed through my screen. I don't have any commands. So you can press up, and it will put in your terminal the last command that you typed. So if I want to do lsl-l again, I can just type up and enter. Or bang, bang. Yes, or bang, bang. All right. I'm sorry. That one went a little fast. Um, any questions? Yeah, what's up? Is ls l the same as ll? It can be. ll is an alias, so it depends on your system. Uh, ls-l works on all of them. ll might work on some of them. So. ll works on bandit. Okay, sorry. cool. So you can also use ll. So we know this is a file. However, dash is a special character. When you do so, when you do something dash dash, it doesn't mean that file. It means something else. It means, okay. So, what? The man page of dash? Oh. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, okay. Basically, what cat means is take whatever is piped into it. So, take whatever is being arrow signed into it and use that as the argument. So, it so what that basically means is if we just do cat dash, then it's just going to think, oh, whatever, it's, so they're, they're arrow signing something argument, they're arrow signing something into me, so I don't need to use that dash, I can just ignore it. That's a problem because we actually want the file name dash. So, how do we tell it that, how do we tell it that we want to actually use the file dash? Yes. So, in Unix, uh, in addition to all the, f if you do ls-al, now this is ls-l, but it's listing all the files. So, normally, if you do ls-l, it obfuscates a couple of them. It doesn't talk about any of these, because these are all considered, uh, they're all what's called hidden files. They're hidden by the operating system. However, if you do ls-al, that shows hidden files. And what we can see in here is we have this dot and this dot dot. Those are really descriptive names. But basically what they mean is single dot means the current directory. So at any point, if I do ls dot, that just ls is the current directory. Dot dot means the directory above it. So this directory, the home directory, is in another folder. This folder is in another folder, and by doing ls dot dot, I don't know what we're going to find up here. Ah! Well, by doing ls dot dot, you get every file that's in the home directory, or every file that's in the above directory. So, as Kent mentioned, what we can do instead of just doing dash, we can do ls dot slash dash. So, what this means is, or not ls. Cat. Cat. So what this means is say, cat, what's in the current directory, look, look at the current directory and find something inside it that's named dash. Because we're not just using this dash, cat understands, oh no, we don't want a dash, we want the actual character dash. We don't just want what's being piped into it. So we can do dot slash dash 
And we have a password. Hooray! Does that make sense? Yes? Nathan. So where does someone go to start learning like all these different Unix commands? Like what's a good resource in terms of learning all the different Unix commands, how they work together, stuff like that? So for specifically these, if you look at Bandit, at each level, they give you helpful reading material. What this basically is, is a little primer or a little bit of a little guide on what's going to be in this level and what are the concepts you're going to need to know. That is why we recommend Bandit, because at each level, they give you a little primer on like a new Unix concept. In addition to this, if you're really confused, again, the man pages are very good. You can Google things. We're also working on a walkthrough currently for Bandit. Uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, but so. That is, uh, that is where we can find some good information on it. Cool. All right. We're going to do two more, one more. Yeah. Do you guys want to do one more, or do you want to work on the rest of them on your own? One more. One more? One more. All right. Should I copy? So we're going to copy the password. All right, so what's the command that we're going to put in in order to log into this? Uh, in order to log into this, someone raise their hand and tell me. Please? Yeah. SSH. SSH. Then what? Address. Then what? And what's the name? All right. It exists, and the password works. Sweet. So we're in the directory. What do you want me to do? I heard someone say it. LS? Spaces in the file name. So. Escaping. <laughs> so. So. Um, why, why everyone's laughing is because as I said earlier, uh, Unix only operates on text. So the way it interprets spaces are, oh, this is a different file. So for example, if I'm going to use cat, if I do cat spaces in this file name, it's going to be like, none of these files exist. There's no spaces, no in, no this, no file name. It thinks these are all different files. So. What do you do with this? How do you, um, how do you figure this out? Well, as I said, let's go look at the, let's go look at what, um, let's go look at what this is. Oh, great. They've given us a Google search for spaces in file name. <laughs> they like to mess with you every once in a while. Well, ah, how to type spaces in the file name. Awesome. All right. So let's look at this. So I'm having this problem. The driver named that. Add a backslash before the white space. So, what? A, uh, by the way, a backslash is this character. So, in Unix, if you want to type something that's what's called a controlled character, something like a dash or a space, you type a backslash in front of it. And what that basically says is, okay, this backslash, whatever the next character is, that's exactly what I want it to be. I don't want it to be used specially. Specially, I just want to use it. So if I do cat spaces in the, or in, I have to be able to type first, this file name, it understands that I want these as one file, and it gives me a password. So just to prove it to you, we're going to, where's my mouse? Where did my mouse go? Oh my god, I'm blind. Ah, there we go. Yep. OK. We have that. that. And then now, I'm going to use the up arrow so I can, yeah, David? Could we have escaped the dash in the previous one? Yes, we also could have escaped the dash in the previous so one. We are now at level three. So I don't want to type the SSH command, so I'm going to hit that up arrow again. It's going to get the last command that I ran. Now keep in mind, this is the last command I ran on my local machine. When I was on my server, those commands didn't count in my history. Those commands were on the server. The last command I ran on my local machine was connecting to the server. 
So then I can do this, bandit3, paste the password, and we're in. However, I'm not going to do that one for you. For the rest of them, you are more than welcome to do them. I highly recommend it, especially if you're new to the terminal. We will be uh, going to the Sec Lab after this if you want to come and work on them there. In addition, we will be having a session on Saturday from 12 to 3, uh, working on these. And if your machine doesn't have Linux and you have no Linux experience, then I'd suggest before that Saturday, go to CPlug's event on Friday from 1 to 2.30. They will be teaching you how to work with Linux, how to put it in a virtual machine or put it on your computer. Uh, thank you very much. If, does anyone have any further questions before I wrap up? Yes. Yes. And what room number is that? Building 20, room 124. 124. Building 20, room 124. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.